I would still be nice and strong. So, so, but when did you go aggressively in the internet? Um, what, what year was it, or was it like slowly trying out, figuring out, and just yeah. put some stuff out and look what happens? I or? think it was um, no. There was an aggressive move in about two thousand seven, two thousand eight, uh, to go to, to embrace the web and all its possibilities, and to invest in the web. Everybody understood that digital was going to be uh, where the action was, but the Atlantic began making investments in the web relative to our print investments that were important. Um, I came to the Atlantic in December 2008 and we had been investing in digital and in hiring writers for the web for about a year prior to that. Uh, and now actually we were quite early the web. We had a website in 1995, but for, for 10 years it kind of bumped along, didn't really make any money, we didn't know how to monetize it at all. But by 2007, 2008, we got very serious about it, um, both in terms of building a business infrastructure that would uh, allow us to monetize, um, and more important, at first, building an editorial infrastructure so we could create a lot of digital content. Uh, and that, uh, we really began doing that aggressively in, you know, uh, seven, eight years ago. And uh, the, the fear is what you talked about is b being cannibalized itself, right? You, you fight with online and print, and right. you may lose some print people. And, uh, it's a real old debate that we, I've been uh, in journalism for 30 years. It's an old debate, maybe, maybe from 15 years ago, will the digital cannibalize our print? Uh, do we need to worry if we put uh, magazine stories up for free, for example, that it'll eat into our print readership. Well, uh, we've just expanded the pie. We continue to have a, a half a million print magazine subscribers, and then you know that means that two, three million people read the magazine based on the so-called pass-along rate. Uh, but we have 30 million monthly unique visitors to the web, and they may they may not be as devoted readers as our print readers are, because the print readers pay for the magazine and t t typically spend you know, an hour of time, of mm. their time with it. But we're getting a lot more reach by having um, uh, the site be so strong. And, and there's a lot of crossover between print and digital where they support each other. And you don't have a paywall online, right? It's all free? Right, we don't have a paywall. Yeah. We've thought about it. We've considered it, we've modeled it, and right now all of our digital content is free unless you want to consume it in the app. And then the, uh, the app, um, uh, you have to pay for the app, and of course we charge um, for the print magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's some uh, channel confusion there. I can read all, everything. I, I'm a magazine subscriber, but I can get all the content for free on the web. We're betting that for some number of people They like the bundle of the magazine. They like the physical experience. They like the paper. And we can continue to charge modestly. We don't charge that much for the magazine. Um, and that'll still be an important business for us. Yeah, also people travel in trains, in sure. airplanes, and uh, sitting on the beach or so, right? You it turns out that paper is the ultimate uh, portable reader. Yeah. <laughs> and and um, the thing is... Um, so, so wh where do you get uh, the, the online readers? You have a lot of Facebook fans, 1.5 million, Twitter, 1.25 yeah. million. So that's quite a lot. So do they come through social mainly, or is it what is the mix like? Yeah, social is a, is uh, the biggest single driver of uh, traffic uh, to the site. Uh, uh, you know, we take care. Um, we, we we pay attention to the homepage. Uh, some small but important percentage of readers come in directly to the front door. But increasingly, and this has been true for four or five years, uh, they're coming in through side doors, whether that's through search, whether that's through other sites like Yahoo or MSN or, you know, you know, your mom's blog dot com, you know, it could be anywhere and especially through social. And we are now getting um, about half of our audience is coming in through social and most of that is through Facebook. And you give your content to Yahoo, for example, it's a partnership, right? You put it there. 
at Yahoo on a website. Right. So we, people we, click through then on your site or? Oh, I'm sorry, we put it where? Yahoo. Oh, Yahoo, yes. For example? Yes. So we have a partnership with Yahoo and um, we give them our content and then they uh, mm -hmm. ideally, uh, people will read a piece there and then click through okay. to read more Atlanta content once they've read the one, the first piece. And you are very successful with native ads. That's also a new thing and you were early on it, very early, right? We were early to, to native advertising, sponsor yeah. content, whatever it might be, really um, branded content and, 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 and uh, branded marketing. Uh, we were early, we've been doing that for maybe uh, five years uh, and it is now a really important part of our business it's a big contributor uh, of our revenue. Um, about two thirds of the digital ad dollars that we get come from companies that are spent that are making native as part of their overall buy with us. So they might also have boxes and banners, but native is an anchor to what they're buying with us. And uh, we built out a, uh, a 25 person division of our marketing department called Atlantic Rethink, and we have writers and editors and designers and developers who work as part of Rethink uh, creating the content and also we have um, uh, kind of a brainstorming team that works with the clients to, to help uh, devise the concepts that we then turn into stories. What is the trick? It has not to be, it shouldn't be boring. Sometimes advertisement is boring, right? Right. And that's, that's, that's the niche, right? You, if you make it interesting, you get readers. I think there's two things. One is to, to try to tell stories the same way we do with our, our own um, editorial content. So to be interesting, to tell stories, to be compelling, uh, and to bring a kind of a journalistic um, values uh, to the enterprise. And the other is to uh, write in a way that um, Atlantic readers expect um, uh, the content to be presented. So not to confuse our readers between advertising and editorial, because we market very clearly as, as sponsor content, but uh, we are able to tell our clients that we know how to talk to Atlantic readers. We know based on our own editorial success and failures, we know what works and what doesn't work and we'll bring those those lessons to the sponsor content that we create for you. And the journalism itself, how, how do you create, what, what is the core of journalism you do? Like it should be interesting, right. it should it should have some interpretation, right? It, it's not just the facts, yeah. facts, facts. Like Right, We no matter what the platform, whether it's in print or whether it's digital or whether it's live events, what we're trying to do at The Atlantic is provide the clearest thinking on the most consequential issues in our time. So uh, that can mean uh, bringing reporting and research, but also bringing judgment and commentary to the equation. Um, we're not an opinion site, but we're also not um, a, uh, a, a kind of who, what, where, when, why uh, fact-based um, enterprise either. Uh, so um, we trust our writers to be fair-minded uh, to approach a, a topic without an ideological perspective and then uh, based on um, the reporting they do and the reading they do and the thinking they do to uh, to present um, uh, an article that will include their judgments in it. How many reporters do we have in total for a full uh, time have, roughly? Uh, on the digital team we have about um, uh, 70 um, uh, that includes writers and editors and on print, it's a smaller number because we have a lot of freelance on print. Uh, we also have freelance on digital, but there's so much more volume on digital that you need a big staff. Uh, but on print, we're more like um, uh, maybe 25 people on the print team. And how many roughly freelance that contribute to? It, it, in every issue, um, uh, probably more than half the stories in the magazine are, are uh, by freelancers. So another like 20 or so freelancers? Well, but there, in the course of a year, oh, they there might switch, be uh, okay. 50, 50 okay, or 50. something like that, maybe even more, because they're not the same ones every issue. But but you create a lot of content, so with 70 writers like online, they, they work hard, right? So 70 it's not writers and editors, so, so they're, not, they're not all writing. But uh, And we've experimented. Uh, uh, before I took this job, I was the editor of our digital site, of our digital properties. Um, for five years till I moved over to this role 
and we experimented during that time uh, what what works best in terms of satisfying the audience and generating a lot of um, uh, audience traffic is it asking your writers to write three stories a day and really crank it out or is it to write one story a day and spend more time or to write one story every other day mm -hmm. um, and uh, every writer has kind of a different set of expectations, but unless we're really, unless you're on the news team, we're really not expecting um, uh, more than one story a day. Mm -hmm. The news team moves very quickly, and that's about a dozen people who are on news. But beyond that, we've discovered for our audience, if the writer spends a little more time working on the piece, um, that will generate uh, that much more interest in the story that many more readers to the story, and in the end, a little more time can um, generate more traffic. Now, not like, not print time, not, you know, we spend um, weeks and even months on print stories. Okay. And I was a print journalist for, for 20 years before I switched over to digital, so uh, our digital team understands there's a velocity um, for the web that's just different from print. What's the perfect length of an article on the web? Is there like some secret like in the length? Is there some range that is recommended or? Yeah, what we've discovered is um, really short is probably not right mm -hmm. um, for our audience, which likes to go a little, a, a little deeper. Um, for example, uh, we've, we just had a 20,000 word cover story in the magazine about President Obama's foreign policy called the Obama Doctrine which was the cover of our uh, April issue, and it w did gangbusters on the web. These are people reading on their phones 20,000 words. Um, a lot of our longer print stories do very well online, so the idea that people will only read short stories is not an experience that, that we are seeing. Uh, uh, most of our digital stories are maybe in the um, 600 to 1200 word range. Not, not really short, not long, but we're having five and 10 and 15,000 word stories, mostly written for print, that can do very well online. And you also had an interview with the president, right? As part of that story, mm -hmm. the Obama Doctrine story included uh, not so much an interview, but a series of conversations over the course of a few months mm -hmm. that uh, we weave together into a longer story. Uh, so it wasn't presented as a Q&A, but the writer did, did have five separate conversations with the president. That's great. Well, yeah. Is that easy to, to get with the president? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, a, really a, I think, a recognition that this particular writer, Jeffrey Goldberg, has earned um, a lot of uh, respect as one of the preeminent um, thinkers, uh, journalistic thinkers, about foreign policy. And the president over time has come to think that what Jeff Wright writes is smart. So, and then when you have the first conversation, they give you a half hour with the president and it turns into an hour. And then he says at the end, we got to finish, talk more later. Uh, that's just because the president is enjoying the conversation. That's how you got the second and third and fourth conversation. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I saw the last uh, edition was sold out at Barnes & Noble in New York. Yes. That's yeah, so. that doesn't happen very often. And we even uh, uh, researched whether we should um, uh, do an, a, a new print run and the time it takes to do it and the expense it takes to do it didn't quite justify because we were only sold out in uh, maybe 10% of the new stands, but, okay. but we were sold out. And um, video, is that a new thing you, you expand or is, uh, how, how are you on videos? Yes. What does it take there? Like so we've um, we built, a, when, I, when I arrived to run digital um, seven years ago, we had no, no video team. Uh, hired one person and her job mostly was to curate other people's video, to spend time on YouTube and Vimeo and um, other places and and then say, hey, we love that video we saw, could we post that to The Atlantic? That was our first approach. Um, now we have 12 people in our video team and we make original documentaries and we do a lot of series with our own staff. Uh, it's a very difficult um, uh, business uh, because um, it's expensive to produce high quality video, expensive in terms of staff time or if you're hiring outside producers or editors, we mostly have enough staff to do that ourselves now. Uh, but there's a lot of demand from advertisers and seemingly from readers. How, how many people work on social media? Because 1.5 million Facebook, one, one yeah. point some Twitter. That's a lot. Like, how, how many 
Is the journalist still putting it on? on yeah, it's journalists. Yeah, they're part of the editorial team, and there's there's social media writers and editors. Um, it's a small team. It's about three or four people. And they run millions of fans. Yeah, they oh. do. I mean, they uh, post to not just Facebook and Twitter, but also to Reddit and Pinterest and um, LinkedIn. LinkedIn, mm -hmm. of course, and and the whole range of opportunities out there. Uh, Facebook is the most important for sure. Uh, now we've started to develop um, secondary channels in Facebook. So we have the Atlantic's Facebook feed, but also Atlantic politics and policy on our, in a Facebook channel. And we're going to start launching uh, technology and business and entertainment as separate Facebook channels, uh, probably because you can only put so much content into your Facebook feed, and then you kind of overwhelm the system. Um, you overwhelm Facebook and you overwhelm your followers. So that we have separate channels. When, when do people read online? What time is, is your peak? In the morning probably a lot? And what, what uh, The peak is usually around, around noon time. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, of course, because we're a global um, uh, site, a global magazine, uh, noon time is different everywhere. But the, we have a big chunk of our readership on the, in the eastern and central time zones in the U.S., so um, our peak is usually between about 11 and 3 p.m. But we don't see this kind of uh, parabola that a lot of sites see where it really is nothing at night and nothing in the morning and only in the middle of the day. We're, we're more like this. And we really um, have uh, audience coming, um, a lot of coming at night, a lot coming overnight. Um, and it starts early in the morning and extends into the middle of the afternoon, partly because it's always lunchtime somewhere. So yeah. people are reading, you know, uh, the West Coast or in the UK or in Asia. Um, so we don't see quite as pronounced a, a, of a thing like that, but uh, it, it is kind of um, lunchtime is uh, an early afternoon. And do you also have staff that works overnight to update the website or like? We, uh, we, we, don't, up, we don't update 24 7 unless there's breaking, you know, really breaking news that we're on top of. Uh, we have um, some people in the UK, which puts us on a time zone wise, you know, we, we have the extra five hours there. So if they're working, you know, early in the morning, then it's really, um, um, uh, we're getting, we're, and, and we have people uh, in LA, we're probably going to hire in Asia to, so we can more fully cover, you know, um, the, the, the clock. Mm -hmm. But all English, right? All English, mm -hmm. yeah. And Actually, what well, well, we, we've launched um, something called City Lab Latino, which so CityLab.com is a separate site from the Atlantic.com, also run by the Atlantic. And City Lab is about uh, urban issues and cities of the future and what's happening um, in in uh, the stories of cities mm -hmm. around the world. And we recently launched with Univision a um, Spanish language version of City Lab, So mm -hmm. that's our first foray into an, a language other than English. Mm -hmm. But we and do have a third of our readers from the Atlantic.com are reading in English outside of the United States. That's One third. Great. They are from South America, Asia, from Britain? Yeah, they're mostly from uh, Western Europe, Australia, Canada, any English speaking, um, you know, some in Asia. Maybe in native, right? Yes. M most native maybe. or, yeah. Or, or Yeah, and expats, you know, uh, expat Americans too. And w what topics do well? What is a magnet on, on your journalism side? For, what do right. people like to read? What kind of things? Politics probably a lot? Well, th you're right. this time of year you can write about politics, this time of, in the cycle. Uh, and we cover politics always, but it's doing very well right now. And we've actually added quite a bit of staff to cover the campaign because it ended up being rather tumultuous on both sides, Republican and Democrat. So uh, right now, politics is doing very well. In an off-cycle election year, uh, we find that we do very well with uh, business, technology, health, uh, and entertainment, uh, as well as politics and also uh, foreign affairs. So we have, uh, uh, and if it weren't an election year, we have a remarkably even distribution among our 10 channels, um, which uh, is testament to the fact that we're basically a general interest site. We're not a politics site. We're not a business site. We're not a technology site. We're general interest. And, and we do pretty well across the board. And how do you see journalism uh, like long term? I was feeling like every part of a second a new blog gets created. And right. it's, it's so much new stuff. So yeah. much content. Pe people can't consume all this content. Right. 
and so they get kind of lost sometimes, right? So w what will happen long term? Like, Well, we're lucky because we have this 158-year-old brand, and so people know what the Atlantic is and what it stands for. So it is hard uh, coming into the market new. Uh, there's, a, there's, you're trying to get mind share, and it's a very crowded, crowded internet market. Um, our the the fact that we have a magazine can help us spike up above all the noise. Uh, the Atlantic cover story can be the most valuable real estate in American journalism because once a month we get to um, rise above all the noise and try to. Uh, say something that can capture the national conversation and if we can do that just five issues out of ten be successful there um, that helps uh, uh, bring attention to the brand and bring readers to the site bring incremental mm -hmm. newsstand uh, sales of course so um, we have the brand going for us you know and, and then you just have to rely on quality journalism and good distribution channels in our case social partnerships optimized for search uh, you got to find ways to get to the reader and you probably do a lot of analyzing which article gets hit the most where people stay the longest where they get right. engaged with comments and stuff right is, we do a lot that, yeah we have an analytics team that follows pretty closely what's working and it's not just what stories do well but like you say uh, um, engagement um, uh, page uh, uh, scroll depth how far down people Finishing stories. Um, we're very interested in making sure that uh, a visitor who comes to the site doesn't just read one story and leave. But we have so-called depth, which is you come in and read two stories or three stories or four stories, and how can we create a site that uh, makes you want to stay? Uh, so we, uh, you know, the scary thing about having all this data is you have all this data, and you have to figure out how to use it. Uh, I was talking once. Um, to a longtime print journalist, who said, oh, "I don't really, um, I don't really like the web because uh, you're constantly trying to make sure people read your stories. I like print, um, where you know people are reading your stories." And I said, "Well, my experience is you don't know the reading your stories in print either. It just you didn't know better, and so you were lulled into a false sense of complacency. Well, my story's out there; it's done. People love it. Well, they might not love it, and what what digital gives you." is exactly how much they do or don't love it, which is data that historically journalists have not had. And you said you are profitable, right, since 2010? Right. And you're still today? Yeah, have been profitable every year and uh, more and more profitable. Last year was our most profitable year in, in the history of the magazine. And, Congratulations. And is it public, be the number? Is it public? Or? No, it's not public because okay. we're a private company. Okay. Uh, you know, but it's... it's, uh, it's uh, it's in the eight digits. Let's put it that way. Eight so, digits. Eight digits. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not. It's not five hundred thousand. You know, eight digits would be ten million or above uh, in in terms of profit. So small, right? That's eight, six, seven, eight. Yeah, that's eight. So eight eight million or no no eight digits means that I'm oh. saying we're 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 profitable. I can't give the number, but it's at least ten million or or more. Ten million or more in yeah. profits. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. So is your budget then growing? You can hire more staff, or or you want to keep it that way and and keep it profitable, highly profitable with the high margins? No, we're, well, we're definitely growing, and we, the way we've improved our profit from nothing to that number, and in our video staff, and in our various other uh, the events divisions. So the only way we know to increase profit is to keep on growing. So we're we're adding all the time. But ten million that means. Ten, if you like, let's say 10 million, just assume that number. So do you, you are better than Washington Post, New York Times, like those oh, flagship? No. Oh, they, 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 they have more profit than that. Yeah? I'm sure. I don't actually know, but okay. But I'm certain. <laughs> you know, I don't know their numbers, yeah, but, okay. um, you know, this, those are those are companies with hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. Yeah. So I don't but, know. If but, but they have a problem on the profit. They have a problem on the profit side. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, those are public companies, so then you can find those. Yeah. Companies. Yeah. I don't okay. Know. I don't know. That. Yeah. That that's a great. Um, that's amazing. So your total staff staff is it a uh, what is it total employees? Total at the Atlantic is right now about about two hundred and sixty. Yeah. Uh, so a small company, um, and that's um, divided in our four areas, which is um, print, digital, live events and consulting and then of course 
um, there's a digit there's, there's a business operation to those and an editorial operation uh, to those and total journalists of the 260 is it half roughly? about half huh? yeah about half those are journalists and what is consulting and live events live is a conference or so? yeah exactly mm -hmm. conference but but we do more than a hundred conferences a year what we topics? Have 50, what we have 50 people mm -hmm. working in our oh. events business, and it contributes 20% uh, of our revenue. This is a real important part of the business. Uh, every topic you can imagine, just like the magazine covers everything, um, uh, uh, technology, uh, politics, business, uh, health, um, uh, across the board, and everything from uh, uh, three, I'm sorry, okay. I. Okay, thank you. Um, everything from uh, two and three day um, okay. uh, events to half day programs. The last thing, consulting. What, yes. what is that? So, um, on the strength. So after the Atlantic made this transition from print to digital and made a pretty strong transition, we got a lot of questions. Well, how did you do that? What can what what, what can we learn? Um, what's the secret sauce? So we started. Um, to uh, a little consultancy to help other businesses, not necessarily journalism operations, but uh, companies, nonprofits, foundations, universities, make a transition uh, to a digital footing and set up digital editorial um, newsrooms. A lot of these places create content as part of their business. If you're a bank, you might have a web page with a lot of content on it. So we help make that transition um, and, and offer that these basically um, digital consulting services help you with a social media strategy, a branding strategy, an editorial workflow. Everything that The Atlantic learned uh, about uh, digital transformations, we bring that um, to other companies. And that's the fastest growing part of our business right now, although still a relatively small part, about 10% of our revenue. And staff? How, how, how many? Uh, 30 people, 25, 30? 25 to 30 people. Is it then local or the whole state? The, uh, uh, across the United States. That's yeah. great. Yeah, across mm -hmm. the United States. So you have a, a nice portfolio that is all around. Like yes. It's not just like one. Well, the nice thing there is it's not advertising dollars because we rely so much on, on, on basically um, uh, consumers to buy the magazine and then advertising dollars. And the consulting business is a little bit... Uh, different, so it diversifies the the revenue. And then you are looking now for a new chief editor. That yeah. your your boss uh, or no the uh, the colleague editor in chief he he left uh, to New York. To He's the going to the New York Times mm -hmm. in two weeks. Yes. Uh, ha have you found somebody? Or you not yet. Around? Are you available? <laughs> we're, we're looking. Uh, we haven't found anybody. We're just starting the process right now. So okay. uh, it's exciting. To it's such a big role, such an important job to fill. So it's really exciting. Although I'm totally sad to lose him because we're great colleagues, but it is a moment to, um, you know, bring someone uh, new in who's great. Yeah, that's Good. an uh, amazing story. Thank you very much for your sure. Time. Yeah, I'm sorry we don't have more time, but I have a uh, sure. I have another meeting. But uh, so this.